Okay, today we talk about uh, multimodal learning. So far we have seen how we can learn representation from natural language corpuses, like plain text, without uh, labels. And also we, we spent a couple of weeks on emphasizing on contrastive learning and uh, specifically for natural images. So we saw how we can learn very, uh, quite good representations for uh, natural images. Um, so some of you may be wondering, is just vision and language the only domains we will work on? Aren't there like other domains or applications? And yes, there are. And you can apply different types of uh, like BERT style pre-training, so basically masking sequences on all the applications. Um, so even though we, we only stay on vision and language, these are like quite general and applicable domains to other, for example, other uh, image-based domains. Like I gave some example with cells and how to learn representation from cells and how it's different from natural, natural language. And as we've seen the last weeks, we will also transfer the ideas and principles from natural languages, so plain human generated text, to model biological sequences such as uh, proteins and RNA, and, and how we can transfer these ideas about representation learning. So today it will be something between the two worlds. So we're trying to combine information from paired data that we call multimodal. So in our case, it would be combining information from natural language and vision. But in general, this approach can be applied in any domain where you have like multimodal paired data. Um, and in the next, in the last part, we'll talk specifically about uh, visual anomaly detection, like a new task. So far, we have seen three different approaches. So the, the other one was called Dino, and you have like this discriminative based task. Uh, while the last two in the last lecture I also presented some mask based approaches for vision. But now we'll do something different. But in order to give you some motivation, I would like to emphasize again about the discrepancy between taking two pre-trained models and evaluate their learned representation using linear probing, uh, on, which is the plot on the left, and using fine-tuning, so basically training both the last MLP or classifier with the pre-trained backbone representation. And there is a big discrepancy between uh, these two evaluation metrics, even on the same task, of classifying uh, one image, like the, the class between these 1,000 possible classes of dogs and flowers and uh, whatever. So this motivates us to this, this motivates us to ask ourselves the question: How general is this uh, the representations that we learn for this specific classifier? Okay, it works from ImageNet but how general and how applicable would it be to other domains? Okay, we have some evaluations, but we want to know more about what the, mo the models learn. We also talk about a lot about the investigating the learning station in the next lecture. So based on that, we will make a small detour and we'll talk about um, some uh, relevant but uh, slightly different topics we will define uh, also, even from the previous lecture, I tried to introduce some ideas of robustness and some, and some different data sets that are more challenging. So let's, start, let's first start from robustness. This term was also really non-intuitive for me in the beginning. So robustness, uh, I will focus on vision, but it applies to, it's a more general idea. So robustness is a way to argue about how the models, how, how the representations uh, are still meaningful under some sort of perturbation on the data. And here I have some examples. So let's say that on, during inference, we are dealt with some data that either masked, blurred, 
or with a very different data distribution than the one that the, the pre-training data distribution. And another thing we will not emphasize so much is adversarial attacks. So this means, for those who want to have like a very high level overview, is that someone who has access to the model weights can um, perform the same way we perform back propagation to update the parameters of the model during training. Given that they have access on the model weights, the same model that we want to deploy on our application, they update not the weights of the model, but the input data. So they manipulate the input data, the images or text, as to instead of um, minimize the loss, to maximize the loss. So they try to manipulate, for example, pixel information that, uh, that is invisible to the human eye. And in this way, they can uh, really fool all these classifiers that we tried so hard to learn and deploy and everything. So perturbation by itself doesn't mean anything. You have to define it with respect to something. So, uh, sorry, robustness is always, or always defined based on the type of perturbations that we have on the data. So we can define robustness towards occlusions or robustness towards masking robustness towards um, augmentations or yeah, we'll see some robustness towards uh, out of distribution data robustness towards natural and shared examples we'll show some pictures later and robustness to the shared attacks so robustness is how much the performance drops for the model given that we apply some perturbation on the images is that clear? Any questions? So why we want to, why we care about robustness in the first place? And you can see all these are these kind of robustness documentation. So this is some study from 2018. Let's say kind of old for the deep learning world, but you can already see uh, from the bar plot. So these are like three different networks. The y-axis indicates the mean corruption error so we corrupt the images in this way that we have these samples on the, on the right side of the plot and you can see that um, so these three models are uh, bigger and more uh, bigger versions of like scaling up the model not only gives you a performance boost on ImageNet like one or two or three percent but it also uh, reduces the corruption error towards all this type of perturbation. So we can easily argue based on the metrics that this larger version of ResNet, they are not only better at classifying the data, like the image validation set by one or two percent, but they are also, at the same time, they acquire, they, acquire, they capture uh, features that are more robust to this type of corruption. Uh, any question? <clears throat> and this is really important for representation learning because the idea uh, nowadays is to train uh, a model on a large uh, on a large and very diverse data set but actually train it only once with a lot of compute and then reuse the same model for hundreds of different applications. So this is, this is the, the tipping point from the last years. So five years ago, things didn't work like that. We had like, for each task, we had uh, some sort of an, a specialized network that was meant to be the best approach for this task. But, and, and trained from scratch, from random initialization. But nowadays, we have these big models that are also called foundational models one year and we train them not us but usually the, the companies who can afford all this compute they train them once uh, with a lot of data and a lot of compute and then we we try to leverage them for various downstream tasks so we want these models to be robust to all these type of perturbations, ideally, yes. But the 
contrasts here are like uh, limited to a specific domain, like if we're dealing with natural images. Yes, on the yeah. same on the same domain, but on hundreds of different tasks, like instant segmentation we talked about, segmatic segmentation, object detection, uh, cell count or counting, or uh, personal identification. Cell count doesn't apply because you're naturally personal identification. You can define hundreds of tasks on top. And <clears throat> here uh, we have these different. Here we have on the. On the, the, the different rows indicate samples from uh, images of bananas, but on different uh, distributions, as we say, on different data sets that are constructed in such a way to be significantly different from the ones on ImageNet. So these are sketches, but more abstract. These are uh, adversarial code. Uh, I will present, this is like uh, different renderings, this R corresponds to red renderings, uh, and this is also some more diverse data sets. And <coughs> if you pre-train this ResNet 101, so a very large model <coughs> trained from scratch with supervised learning on ImageNet, it, it performs poorly on the other data. Here you can see it's, the result is uh, we usually me measure the performance degradation. So an ideal model we would have the same score towards all these data sets because it's a model that needs to classify bananas. So the ideal behavior would be to have 76.2 accuracy. And, and the worse the model gets, the less robust we say it is. So we know that uh, supervised pre-training from scratch leads to very bad uh, lead to very poor representations with respect to distribution cities because the model is incentivized to learn everything that, that, that exists on the data set just to classify the current images. Any questions? So these are, I present also in the end of the previous lecture, so these are some very special type of images, they're called natural adversarial examples. So adversarial means that the model has a very hard time to recognize the sample, but they are uh, natural with respect that we don't manipulate this pic the pixels of those images adversarially with some sort of back propagation or training. These are just some images that the model has never seen, or types of images, like uh, we'll also talk about satellite images example that the model has a very hard time and this is uh, an image this is the real class so this is like a photosphere and the model is kind of always biased towards classifying as a jellyfish with a very high probability and this is um, these are two data sets that's called image and O and A that are really uh, difficult for the model to classify especially for supervised models and this is the different renderings indicated by the descriptions below the images. So it's not the real class, it's just the different types of renderings. So the model needs to be invariant to this type of rendering, to, to rendering tasks, to different rendering types to be able to still recognize the correct class. The sketches, and uh, this is uh, the models we have presented so far in the course apart from the top one we'll talk today. So this is the mass of encoder, this is the dyno, this is the iPod who takes dyno as a baseline and adds this mask image modeling on the path level, try to, we mask some paths and then we try to reconstruct them with, reconstruct their features with cross entropy. Um, and this is the latest state of the art model that relies only on the visual signal, only on image. <clears throat> so the second question is, okay, we have some data set, but we also want to know, uh, we also want to argue about this uh, divergence, this discrepancy between training uh, linear probing, training just a classifier on top, versus fine-tuning. So here we'll define some uh, additional uh, terminology. So the first one is called few-shot learning. What does it mean? Uh, 
Um, so it means that for the downstream task, we have a very limited number of examples. So instead of having the whole EMATnet, we have 1% of those data available. And we want to learn based only on the 1% of the data. So this enables us to argue about how these representations can transfer even with very few samples per class. Um, and uh, a couple of years ago, uh, one very common approach that I have here on the image on the right would, have to, would be to, to use this kind of pre-training where you have this multitask learning. So you have like uh, some images, you, you can imagine the application of autonomous driving where you want to identify stops, you want to identify pedestrians, you want to uh, segment objects, you want to have the road lines. So it's a type of multitask pre-training. And uh, you have some annotated data and you pre-train on all those tasks. And all of those different heads, as you can see here, task A, task B, task C, which are like specifically specific classifiers for its subtask, set some layers. So this is like the, let's say, old way of doing things again, four or five years ago. And then we have the zero-shot learning. So this is a bit more tricky. So you have, again, a model in general that's trained with either supervised or self-supervised learning. It doesn't really matter. We have such, which has seen some specific number of classes or images. And then you want to use this model without any tuning directly for testing to unseen images. And to do so, you need some uh, additional information, as we will see. And this used to be, in the, in the past years, I'm providing some context for the approach that we see today. Um, so you need this auxiliary information. So for example, on the image on the right, uh, you have these uh, attributes or uh, semantic information that you try to map those images to different attributes. So a value of uh, one, for example, on this attribute indicates that this image has a tail, and then you try to kind of come up with a way to map those attributes to classes. Uh, but in general, super, uh, both supervised and self-supervised models struggle with zeros of learning, which is the way, uh, which is why we will present some multimodal approach to solve uh, this problem of zeros of learning. So the approach we will discuss today is called uh, CLIP. This is the abbreviation and it's, uh, it means contrastive language image pre-training. So language image, it means that we have two domains, language and vision, natural language and Vision. Contrastive stands for the contrastive laws we have seen already. And you can also find this in the literature as natural language supervision. And I will explain how it is different from annotating a single class to an image. Or weak supervision. So why we call it, why we come up uh, with a new term? So we have an image on supervised learning and we have a label like uh, cut. So this is a supervised case. In the unsupervised or self-supervised case, you don't have this information. So in by natural language supervision, what we mean is that we have uh, a sentence or a bunch of sentences We have a sentence that refers to these emails, so the data are paired, but we don't know exactly where the class information is with respect to the emails. It's just some description that it's one or two sentences, and it refers to these emails, but we don't know exactly if there is a class and so on. I have some examples. And the motivation uh, is that as you can imagine, this type of 
data sets in order to create these curated data sets. You need to uh, isolate the object in the image. That's why all these image, uh, these image based uh, data sets are object centric, as we say. So usually there's an object most of the time in the center. And even on these data sets, you have a lot of noise. So usually you can have uh, uh, an image with a, with a cat lying on a doormat or like a cat being hugged from a human. And then you have to give a single label. So you have to decide if you annotate it as a cat or as a doormat or as a cat and a human. So you have this type of problems here. You need a lot of workers. So this data set that contains the, the largest publicly available data set, which is image 22 k okay, has 14 million images. So imagine how many people need to work to annotate this data one by one, like human, like manually annotate all this data. Apart from the fact that they have a lot of errors. And you have 22,000 plus. Um, and this is just the beginning of the problem because you will pre-train on this model with supervised learning and then for each task you need to define your own data set you need to build your own data set train an output head so the representation is not readily available as we say you need to have like also a downstream task some data for the task train the head or like linear probing or fine-tuning the whole model so this is a big motivation <coughs> and the second idea is uh, uh, the difference the difference with respect to scaling between natural language and vision? So in natural language, the scale of which we can train models across thousands of GPUs and uh, billion scale billion scale parameter uh, billion scale parameters. Yes, I think the largest model is more than. 5 billion parameters at the moment and even publicly available uh, why in vision just recently there was the first billion scale model so the idea um, uh, here is how can we what would be a, a, a good way to, to move to, to go to scale up in terms of model parameters uh, by leveraging this multimodal uh, nature of data. Like this type of data sets maybe will help us scale up the models even further for vision. <coughs> so the idea is <coughs> let's find per data. We cannot have this type of supervision that are like humanly annotated. We are going into, as we say, like Images that are on the wide, so images that they, they exist on the web, like Instagram images or Flickr images. However, instead of a single class, a single object, these images have sentences corresponding to. Uh, so, for example, here you can see, let's take uh, this one that's referred like a description about somebody who uploaded the video about the, an image about the hotel. So we know that there are abundant data that we can find online and they are paired even though they are not like perfect annotations that's why we call them weekly supervised data or naturally language, natural language supervision. And the additional benefit is that here we have a lot of diversity or variability on those data because we collect them on the wide. We will argue about the variability later on. So what they did in this uh, first paper from OpenAI in 2021, uh, almost two years ago, um, they found on Wikipedia the, the most frequent uh, queries, so the, the, the people, the, the concepts that people set search more on Wikipedia, the 500,000 topics that people search are interested in Wikipedia. And based on this text, they search for images on the web that include this text. No neural networks and stuff, just pure sense. And, 
and then they just sampled a couple of, of those data. So here they say per query about 20,000 per data to create this sort of balancing. Uh, and they consider the queries all the topics that are uh, at least 100 times referred to in the Wikipedia, so what people are mostly interested in. Okay. So let's say we have the data. What do we do? What would be the, uh, the easiest task, the easiest um, pretext task to create on those data? Do you have any idea? task would be just to take the image, come up with some model, we'll talk about it, and try to predict uh, the, the sentence. Um, and this can be done, again, you need to output some sort of uh, different, uh, okay, you need to pass to the maximum sequence length, and then here you have some word predictions where the maximum number of words is the vocabulary, so you need to have some vocabulary, and then you try to predict, for example, I don't know, maybe cross entropy or something like that. So this would be the most naive way to use this data. So this solves the problem of leveraging the data, but we still have a model that predicts some classes, and then we probably need to fine tune it in some way for some downstream task. So this solves one of the problems. <clears throat> so in the literature, if you follow up, uh, this task is called image captioning, and it's a very interesting task for people working on computer and vision. So there are many people who don't want to have like a single class for the whole image, but they want the description. So you can automate, you can automate different things. So ideally, you can imagine an application in, uh, in medicine, in medical images, where you could produce, you could automatically produce some report, not just output the class, the pathology of like a brain MRI or an X-ray, but you can actually automate the report process. Um, and these models are usually encoder-decoder approaches. And uh, there, are, there is a lot of literature on this task by itself. Any clear about any questions about the, the image captioning of the task? No? Uh, however, in the in the approach we talk today, we'll we will not predict the sentence, but we will directly work on the feature space and use the, the well-established objective of contrastive learning or influency. So instead, we have two initially randomly initialized encoders, no decoder, as, as previously in the literature. So the text encoder takes uh, a sentence as a sequence, so it's a small tra a transformer model, not a vision transformer, uh, for language, and produces uh, representations for each separate word, so the word embedding or word representations, as you would like. 
Then we have Animas encoder. You can think of like a ResNet or a Vision Transformer, uh, which gives you. Uh, ah, sorry. One detail that I missed is that these uh, different representations are for. Are, we only use one text representation for the whole sentence. We don't have worldwide representation. So T1 corresponds to the first sentence on the minibus. T2 corresponds on the whole sentence. So we want to aggregate all the representations. How, yes. can, how can you choose N in this case? Like the N? Yeah, the N is the minibus. The bus size. Okay, if this is a vision transformer, this would be the output of a CLS token that kind of has like an aggregated uh, representation of the whole world, of, of, of all the words in the sentence. Mm -hmm. So we have n different text representations which correspond to sentences. We have n different uh, representations that correspond to different images on the mini box. Like this is like the, this puppy is the first image, so this is representation. And then we compute the similarity matrix again. It's just that we will need to redefine what is the positive and what is the negative, which is indicated. But can somebody try to imagine what is the positive, what is the negative, how many classes we have based on this figure? What do we want to maximize? The, the values on the diagonal? Yes. Exactly. We want to maximize the values of the diagonal, so we want to push together the images, image, images and texts that are paired inside the mini bus dimension. So the diagonal here are all the positives, let's say, and we pull uh, we pull apart the non-diagonal entries. So when i is different from j, so all the non-diagonal elements refer to uh, non-matching image text pairs. Is that clear? Uh, I don't know for those in uh, contrastive learning between images we excluded these elements because this was the representation from image 1, p1 and this was the representation from image 1, p1 and we define this classification task where we want to push together the representation from images from uh, different views. And, uh, okay, if we go back here, how many classes do we have? You know, contrastive learning, we discussed that contrastive learning is basically cross entropy, right? Mm -hmm. so we try to. So let's try to imagine this as like a cross entropy, like as a classification task. So instead of logits, so the logits here would be again the similarity. So one can define uh, a classification task for each row. So from one to n, uh, we can you can you can imagine that this is a, a cross entropy classifier where the correct the correct class in cross entropy you pass the index of the correct class here we, you pass the index for uh, zero let's say it's like zero index yes? but in this case you need to make sure that like, uh, a class happens only once in the batch can you repeat? Like you have only one image of a dog in, and one text talking about dogs in the batch so you match those and yes and this would be the positive and this would be the negatives that we push away with contrastive learning, you remember the denominator in the contrastive loss. There may exist some images. Yeah, there may be exist, but they don't share the same text descriptions. So yes, you still have the problem of the negatives, but uh, you use a very big bat size to kind of balance this again. You need a bat size of 2000 or something. There's a casual problem with uh, contrastive approaches. So, with respect to the image encoder, this is a classification task for each row where we 
we try to like the, the correct class is the diagonal element, so from 0 to n, n, n minus 1. And for the text encoder, you can imagine a classification task with respect to the columns. So we want to match the text in the in a feature space. So this feature space also needs to be shared. We need to have the same dimension in order to take the dot product. Uh, we'll talk about that later. So independent of the image encoder and the text encoder, we need a projector. If you remember from SimCLR, we had the uh, V1, U2, this was the encoder. And this was the MLP, where they did all these analysis so that this is beneficial. And this was called a projector, as far as I remember. F, Z. So you minimize the loss here, but then you use those representations. So in our case, this would be the image and text encoder that we want to use the representations. And here, uh, instead of an MLP, they just use the linear layer because they didn't find when you have different domains, multiple domains, they found that it doesn't really matter if you use an MLP or a linear layer. So they just use the same layer. So in case you want to see the paper and the pseudocode, that's why you see this cross entropy defined. So you can imagine this cross entropy for uh, with respect to the rows and the columns. Uh, for those who want to check the code. And I also include the multi-GPU implementation if you are interested to see how this stuff are implemented in, in, in practice. Um, so one of the findings is that they did they, like a small finding, let's say, is that they use a linear layer instead of an MLP. Um, so the critic or the projector is just a linear layer here. So this enables us to use different types of models and sizes for the text and image encoder. All right, so the baselines. So here we go back to evaluating how data efficient is this model and how does it compare to different baselines. So in research, if you want to propose something, you already need to have like existing baselines. And for that, they, they use these, um, some models that uh, are trained with the with the, with the task of image captioning, so directly predicting the sentences. So the, the orange uh, line corresponds to a, a method from 2016 that predicts the exact uh, sentence. Um, this one is another baseline, not really useful. They just try to train a model that is initialized from, from natural language and they don't provide a lot of information as to why this model, how this model was trained. So the bigger um, gist is this efficiency, this 4x efficiency that you see on the, on the arrow. So they argue that when they change the, object, or the objective from predicting the actual text to the contrastive objective where you push together things on the feature space and pull away the positives and negatives. Uh, it's the exact same objective that we use for natural images with different augmentations. Instead of here, instead of having two views of augmented versions of an image, we have the image representation and the text sentence representation. And we pull those together. Is that clear? Okay. So, um, you can see here how this model scales up and when the model is much more uh, efficient, like sample efficient, so the more you go um, on the upper left side of the curve, the more data efficient is the model. So ideally, a model that only sees, so here we have the process images during training. So ideally, you know, you could learn from you could train a model with seeing just a couple of thousand images and get perfect performance if you have the ideal behavior. There are 
there are follow-up works that uh, argue that uh, the main advantage is not the objective itself, but the diversity of the data. Uh, so this 4x data efficiency with respect to the image captioning is really questionable. And I'm also not pretty convinced because the user baseline from 2016, why they could use something more, like a more sophisticated uh, image captioning framework. Um, so we have a data efficient model in any case. Uh, this is the first motivation that I said about scaling up the model, the data using more compute. And the second advantage of using this contrasted lear learning based objective is that you can directly use it without training a model on top to do zero shot uh, classification. How? Um, we discussed on, uh, that you need some auxiliary information for zero-shot learning. So here, the auxiliary information is that you need, um, so for each image classification task, you just need to know the label. Okay, and what do you do with the labels? You have the text encoder and you pass not exactly the labels that you see, but this kind of you convert all the different label or class names into a description. A, a photo of a cat, a photo of a plane, and stuff and so on. And using this auxiliary information of the label names, you learn you you don't learn, you do inference from the text encoder. So the a very well-trained text encoder. So I don't know if you understood that the tech, both of these networks are optimized during pre-training. So after pre-training, this text encoder has seen thousands of text descriptions that are very likely to include the label names of the downstream data set that we care about. So you take the, the label names, you do some sort of processing then, like sort of processing, like adding some additional text. Um, so this part we discuss is called the prompt engineering, and you've probably heard about it a lot recently with all these uh, chat GPT models, which is basically you have an excellent model and you try to find tricks to formulate the task in such a way that the model can give you the best possible answer. Uh, but in any case, using the label names, you get this additional information, which is, a, which is a representation corresponding to its label. And then you find the one with the closest similarity. You, you take the image, the test image, and you see how the test image uh, basically yeah, the highest similarity between the, the test image and the different possible texts from the downstream classes that the network has never been explicitly trained with supervised learning. So there is no head, no classifier. This is the representation. This is the representation. And you see the one with the highest uh, similarity. And then you can argue that this is the real label. The, the, we, we predict the class without ever being training a model or fine-tuning anything. Is that clear a bit? Okay. So this is the core advantage, I would say, of using this type of multimodal learning with contrastive learning. While in this case, where we, where, where we would predict the description, it would be very hard to with, during pre-training, if you predict the, the sentence, it, it's very hard to, uh, you need to fine-tune again the model and stuff. So I want really to emphasize, it's like 100% clear what are the advantages of using such an approach. And here are some results. Um, so these two curves correspond to 
the green one corresponds to a very well configured prompt engineering. So they play a lot on how they provide information to the model. So for example, a, a data set with flowers, uh, they provide a description, an image of a label, label ID of a flower or a satellite photo of this, for example, from a farm. So this, or a, a photo of a small, uh, and then the, the label. And with this type of tricks, they are able to increase the model performance. And you can even combine this different prediction in a way similar to model and samples. So you take different predictions and then you try to you take different text prompts, different tests, and then you combine the, their predictions. So this is a, some sort of model and sampling you can do. And you can you can have like a lot of improvement. So here we saw some 5% improvement without even training a model, like a, a model on top. Uh, on the other hand, there are this model is trained on images that, uh, images that exist online, so it's not a. If they are not representative of all the possible uh, images one would have for a downstream task, and for example, this one, it, this is the, this is the difference. So this is like a bar plot, and it shows the difference between a supervised model, fully supervised uh, ResNet, I think versus zero shot uh, clip. So this type of model, independent of it's a transformer, or I think the, in the end they use a vision transformer. But the most important to see where this model performs poorly is that this type of satellite images, this is a, a data set where you have to predict how far away are 